everyone, welcome back to what might be the final Gundam Witch from Mercury Comprehensive Review episode ever. I'm everybody's friend, Mia Buster Green, and I am now monetized because Saleta is a goddamn saint. And with that, and with the work of my cool-ass animation team, we've officially finished the first major scene of my anime this week, putting us on track to have the whole thing eventually done by the end of the year. Thank God. Anyway, alright, let's get down to the meme roundup and the recap of the last episode. The last episode was episode 23, and it was the big climactic super battle where all the cool stuff went down. Starting us off with a super life and death battle between Ghoul and Lada Jaturk, otherwise known as the Jaturk Brothers, sometimes referred to in Japan as the Super Ghoul Brothers. Wouldn't it be the Super Jaturk Brothers? Eh, whatever. Anyway, yeah, someone pointed out that this is the first time we've seen two Jaturk brand mobile suits fight each other, and yeah, it was a very, very cool fight. And yeah, they had a fight for pretty much no reason, or just because Lada went nuts, and mostly because Lada went nuts, and Lada almost killed his damn brother because he was so nuts. But then he didn't, because of friggin' Felsi Rolo. Winning the meme round of this week for the most memes, the coolest memes, the best memes, Felsi Rolo wins the week. Instantly propelling herself from a barely interesting background character to the new best girl of the show and leading wife candidate for Gold Shirt. Once again, so many Felsi memes came out this week. I had to skip over a few of the less funny ones. But here are the best of the best, because when it seemed like Ghoul was about to die, definitely going to die, Felsi showed up with a space fire extinguisher and saved his life, epically. The crowd went wild. And because she literally destroyed this death trope from playing out, someone drew a quick firefighter to Felsi, and then after that we got Felsi traveling around the multiverse, disrupting canon events. We have Felsi here, disrupting the ending of Gundam Dolo 80, now ending with a happy ending, where Bernie and Christina get married because Felsi did it. And oh shit, Spider-Man 2099 is not going to tolerate this, so he showed up in the turn again to stop Felsi. What the fuck? Anyway, that's that's all. That's a lot of nonsense. So anyway, moving on. Other memes. There were some uh, cool art of the Caliburn. We got a lot of cool Caliburn art last week too, but I skipped over it because a lot of them were just super cool and not funny. Then we got a couple of awesome airy memes. We have this one where. Someone imagined how funny the fight in episode 23 would have been if the girls didn't have gun nose and it was just Saleta getting willed on by Ari. And then we got this girl who just wants to get along. And yeah, Mirin also thinks they should just be a normal, happy family. And uh, a lot of people are like standing Mirin for like how like dedicated she is to the family. Someone else drew like them as a normal, happy family. And then someone else pointed out that they're more of a war crime family. And then the last big meme of the week was Gunharo. Gunharo was a thing because Prosper just gave all her his guns. We got this one guy here rooting for Elon 5 to survive. And then the episode ended on another massive cliffhanger with Eri blocking the giant enemy space laser to save her family because G-Witch is all about family in the end. Now finally there were some light predictions for what will happen in the next final episode. Some people are thinking Eri will survive and fight the giant death laser. Sure, that sounds cool. And of course, everyone is thinking Aerie will survive because Felsi will show up and save her at the last second. Now that's all the good memes that are worth printing, but uh, but it's not everything that happened this week. I'll second guess this later, but a lot of people were also bemused that G-Witch Season 2 was very, very fast-paced and didn't have enough time to go over some certain like major plot issues. And yeah, I'll get into that later. One more other thing I'm going to have to get into later. I might have to do this in a second video, but some more happened with the Witch for Mercury Jaxa collab. That started, like, releasing content of Saleta and Mirin, like, doing commercials for Jaxa. And, yeah, I'll maybe talk about that later. Anyway, yeah, tune in for another video about that. For now, let's watch Gundam the Witch for Mercury, the final episode. Holy crap. Okay, so we start the last episode at the second area was shot by the super laser. Captain America prepares to fire it once again, and as he's getting ready to do that, he deploys an MS squad to, like, clean up the debris. Saleta flies over to see if her older baby sister is still alive, and whoa, the memes were exactly right. Felsi immediately shows up on scene, trying to rescue Aerie. A thousand points to Team Felsi and everyone who believed in her. Anyway, Saleta, meanwhile, is having a complete panic attack from the fact that Aerie might have died. And suddenly, as she's having this panic attack, the permit gets to her. Now, the caliber goes dark and Saleta loses consciousness, but strangely, this is not the end of the battle, because Saleta and Aerie are both brought back to the ship, and surprisingly, Saleta is still alive, just not okay. She tries to get up, but the permit is still microwaving her hot inside her body. Now, Roji explains that the solar system weapon is a giant orbital laser platform, 
And meanwhile, Murine is trying to interrogate Prospera, but surprisingly, there was a B team. The B team consisted of Kanaji and Choo Choo, and they all got captured by Prospera's pirate crew, and way to suck, B team. Um, once again, I wish there had been time in the episode to actually explain that there was a B team, because now we're just seeing the B team as they get captured. Captain America has a minor argument with Delling that he has the right to make a quiet zero because it's a threat to security. And meanwhile, the two minor Earth House kids say they can do something by linking the Ariel and the Calvern together. And this might save Ares' soul stuck in the Ariel. Now, Lada shows up at this point, and Lada is surprisingly sane again, too. So he forgives Saleta for being a bully to her. And anyway, then the Calvern launches off again, carrying the Ariel's desecrated torso. And I'm completely shocked that Saleta just got back up and got back into it so fast. Anyway, at this point, the SAL army has arrived to beat everyone up, and Ghoul leads his own force to try and get them to stand down. And then the SAL commander thinks that this is a bad time to have a mobile suit battle right now, especially given the chance that the solar system weapon could go off and blast them again at any moment. So, did they actually have a battle or not? Did she cancel the battle? Anyway, then Mirin and Kaneji discuss that the solar system weapon was built as a Lagrange power plant, and everyone knew it could totally be turned into a weapon because it had a big stupid cannon stuck to the end of it. Prospera's pirate crew asks the aerial Gundam come back, and Murian is trying to lecture Prospera that Saleta is obviously going to bring the aerial back because she wants everyone to be together. And at that point, Saleta shows up with the aerial, and Prospera lets everyone inside. Saleta's happy, Prospera's happy, everyone's just super happy at this moment. So yeah, the two Gundams come inside, Prospera's super happy to see Saleta. And she asks her to reattach the aerial Gundam to the Quiet Zero's mainframe because that will save Aerie. But Saleta says she's not going to do that. She doesn't want to do that. Now at this point, Prosper tries one last time to either reason with Saleta or gaslight Saleta. Anyway, she says she's dying and the gun permit is rendering her paralyzed and her legs don't work. Bell says she has a data storm infection and she's like, yeah, I have a data storm infection. That's why my legs don't work anymore. Now, Saleta's take on things is she doesn't want to give Aerie back to Prosper at all, and she doesn't want the Quiet Zero to potentially kill Prosper with Data Storm blowback. So, Saleta decides she's going to take control of the Quiet Zero herself, and I guess she wants to destroy it from the inside out. So, yeah, she connects to it and she turns it on full blast, and yeah, she just gets overwhelmed with the Data Storm. Now, Saleta barely manages to connect to the Data Storm without dying, and shocker, when she connects to it, she sees Elon 4. Elon 4 was in the Quiet Zero all along. Completely unexpected ghost appearance. So Elon 4 reveals that his data got backed up because he was an enhanced person, and it got backed up to the Quiet Zero somehow, so now he's just a ghost like Aerie. Now, Saleta is completely moved to tears seeing Elon 4 again. I guess Elon 4 really was her boyfriend. And she touches him with the Gundam, and then I guess Elon's ghost does something or other and they all fly away together. So Leta flies out of the Quiet Zero with the Ariel and Elon Force Ghost, and the Gundam reactivates, and when the Ariel Gundam reactivates, all the bits fly over because I guess they were just floating free form in space. So Ari wakes up, and she starts psycho-babying at Saleta, and she says Saleta's a freaking goof because Saleta has all the freedom in the world. She could have gone anywhere, so why is she at the Quiet Zero nearly dying? Now, Saleta says she's nearly dying because she's greedy and she wanted to do things right and make things right with her mom and her sister. And Aerie finally accepts Saleta for this. So, Aerie gives Saleta, or rather the Calibur, the bit array from the Ariel. And this somehow manages to purify the Caliburn's data storm, sending Caliburn into super holy rainbow pride monk mode. Now, I'm not sure what exactly this does, but it seems to be an upgrade and it seems like it's not hurting Saleta anymore. Now, in the meantime, Miri tells everyone that she's going to dissolve the Benner Group and give all of the Benner Group's assets to Earth, which will settle the dispute between the Benner Group and the SAL. It'll literally carry out Shadik's plan, but Miri carried it out without pulling off terrorism. And Shadik is actually extremely satisfied with all this. And the Earth House commanders, who never really got to do anything, are also really happy with this. The Pale Witches, meanwhile, are devastated because Miri just sold all their shit away. And OG Elon quits us in a moment because he admits he has no real interest in playing out a role, especially if he doesn't have to because the Barrack Group no longer exists. Then Hyper Rainbow Mode Caliber and suddens the Gundam Ferrak and the Schwarzette using her Super Data Pulse thing. And they all fly together around in a big silly circle. And then this big silly circle turns into a massive Data Storm Pulse. 
Somehow this data storm pulse is so large it fries the entire solar system array, shutting it down so it can never be used again as a death weapon. Although, wasn't it actually a power plant? So anyway, Sela destroyed a power plant. Anyway, meanwhile, Choo Choo takes everyone home in the Apollo space lander, and Sophia Noria got a quick cameo as ghosts in the window, and finally Honoria got scolded by her husband who came back from the dead, also her dead mentor was there, and also all the dead people from the prologue just showed up as ghosts and like, basically they all got together and they had like an intervention for her, and they either told her she should be a good mom to her kids or she should just join them in the afterlife, you know, it was like one or the other. So then Saleta shows up suddenly and says that she is the one who called out all the ghosts with the aerial to talk to Prosper and Celeste says that she loves her mom and she's going to support whatever Prosper wants to do next. So then Ari comes out and Ari and Prosper finally have a big talk and Prosper's just moved to tears finally seeing Ari and Ari says that she's good with the way things are and she just wants to stay with Celeta and everyone and finally Prosper stops being crazy. Like that's what I've talked. It took it took Ari coming out and like telling her to like stop being crazy. Anyway, meanwhile, the Quiet Zero and all the Gundams at this point start to melt. They literally start melting into nothingness. They're melting because they reached some sort of maximum permit overload, and now the permit's like eating the metal, I guess. Anyway, the Quiet Zero just peacefully fades away and disappears. The Caliburn melts too. Wait, the Caliburn melts too? Now Celeste is staring in space. Gah! So, thankfully, her dumb Heatman keychain, I guess, was a tracking device. Anyway, so Mirian and Choo Choo rescue Saleta, and this scene is an homage to when Amra Ray was rescued at the end of the original Gundam. Like, there's a lot of the same, like, terminology. But then, as it turns out, Saleta's not dead, so Mirian starts crying because she's just so relieved. Saleta wasn't dead at all. She was just sleeping in space because she's a goofball, and Mirian is just relieved to tears. So then we fast forward to three years later. Nika is finally being released from prison. And yeah, she was definitely in prison. Anyway, all the Air Force kids come to get her. And then they recertify her as a mechanic right away. Uh, so she got a prison haircut. Anyway, Choo Choo and Roji eventually became dock workers together. Why together? Anyway, Elon 5 dedicated his life to seeing all the places in Nori's notebook. But because none of the places were labeled with addresses, he had to dumb guess it, and I guess he just took a vague vacation to where she used to live. Mirin got a man haircut. Shadik was still in prison. Interestingly, I guess they tried to charge him for like literally every single terrorist incident in the show, but he wasn't involved in the Quiet Zero incident. And Mirin points out that he wasn't just the plant quite a one. Anyway, Shadik is finally having a trial for his crimes three years later, and he says goodbye to Mirin because he's expecting the trial not to go well, and he's never going to see her again. Now. On a weird note, it seems that Mirian has adopted and accepted Ari into her life as like a permanent cyber ghost. And uh, yeah, Mirian now has both the keychains. Now, Petra lived but lost both of her feet, Quentin Tarantino, very sad. And Petra and Lada got a happy ending anyhow. Ghoul and OG Elon became business partners somehow, and Cecilia became their secretary. And I guess together they reopened the Astaska School, and they gave Felsi and Kananji jobs there. Weird. Ghoul mentions that Jaturk really isn't making much money, so Cecilia says they won't make any money at all until they finish paying their rebuilding costs. And then there's a brief montage that Shadik's harem eventually got released in jail. The Earth protesters were never really happy. And Miri tried to calm them down, and I guess she also gave Shadik's harem some jobs on Earth. The harem girls say, though, that they gave the Barrow Group's assets to the Earth. And since it's been three years, the richest people in space have already bought back most of those assets. So really just Mirin dissolved the Benner Group for nothing. But nonetheless, the former Benner Group CEOs are still under investigation for the legal case around the Quiet Zero because people died there. And then there's a blink and you'll miss it shot of the fucking pale witches retired peacefully. Like they retired to a retirement home. Is this a good ending for them? I mean, they look miserable, so I have no idea. Maybe they just always look like that. That one kid that helped out Ghoul in the bathroom finally got sent to school. I guess Ghoul paid for it. And surprisingly, Saleta and Prospera got a pseudo-happy ending with Saleta chasing around orphans in a wheat field. The wheat field might be a reference to the Golden Autumn ending from Turning Gundam, but anyway, Mirin shows up and waves her wedding ring to the camera. And Anyway, Saleta has apparently been in rehab the past three years because she got permit damage from using the Caliburn, but she's almost back to normal. 
She's planning on opening a school on Earth, and I guess they're all just going to retire in the countryside. Ariasu chimes in for a moment to explain that she miraculously had her consciousness transferred into the Heatman keychain. Ari explains that Selena just miraculously pulled it off before the Calvary disintegrated. And Mirin still seems a little cringed out that now her keychain is haunted by her sister-in-law's ghost, but she's going to accept it. All the Earthhouse kids show up in the van and they call Mirin over for dinner. And that's it. Roll the credits. As the credits roll, we get the blessing as the final song, and that's it, the show's over. We get a thank you for watching message, and we get one more cute art piece of Selena and Nereen laughing at all the haters in the audience, because they got married. So yeah, love won in the end, gay marriage happened, and also I guess Nereen totally became a man in the relationship, because at the end she got a man haircut and a man suit and a job. Well, that's over now. Hmm. Okay, let me just break down the ending, because the ending was... A lot to process and I'm still like processing it so Soleta almost died from too much permit but she powered through it and with three years of rehab she can walk again she finally stood up to her mom and instead of using the quiet zero to just bring Aerie back 100% she instead used the quiet zero and all the guns in the area to first shut down the super deaf laser along with the super long-distance permit data blast that required and then I guess Elon 4 helped show Soleta that she could use the Quiet Zero to bring back literally anyone who had ever interacted with the Gundam. So then she instead used that to bring back the ghosts of all the people who died in the prologue so they could all show up and give Prosper this intervention and talk her down from this ledge. Kind of a weird ending. Like, I get it was trying to do its own thing, but then it was also trying to do a lot of the original Gundam's ending mixed with a little bit of the Zeta Gundam ending. So yeah, it was like a little bit its own thing, but also like a little bit referential to those other two endings. Like a lot of the dialogue syncs one for one with the ending of the original Gundam. Like Eri basically quotes Lala soon, telling Amuro to go live his life when she like tells Selena to do the same thing. The crazy new type ghost explosion at the end of Zeta Gundam was also referenced here. Now in Zeta Gundam, that was a whole different thing. Like there were ghosts in space and they had all been summoned by the Zeta Gundam's biosensor and they all got together and decided Haman and Skaraka were too dangerous to live, so they, like, helped Camille and Judo murder them. Um, this version, with Saleta and Elon 4 using the Quiet Zero to bring back all the people whose data was stored in the gun permit, that felt a little bit more purposeful and a little bit more scientific than the Zeta Gundam ending. Like, it was kind of the same thing, but a lot less convoluted because it actually had, like, a basis in the show's pseudoscience. I have mixed feelings though that Sophia and Noria showed up at the end, like kind of because they were bad guys. I guess though, if it's all pseudoscience, scientifically, if like the Quiet Zero was just bringing back everyone who ever touched a Gundam, then yeah, I guess it makes sense. But it also felt a little bit like ser fan service, and I felt kind of robbed that Yon Five never got to like see her again, even though she showed up at the end. Overall, though, it's weird how many plot lines in the show just fell apart because the second season felt incredibly rushed. And I feel like that did the show a massive disservice since it, like, had less of a chance to do its own thing and it had to more fall back into, like, references to previous Gundam shows. Like, I'm glad the Pale Witches finally got their comeuppance and, yeah, they have to be poor for their ending to be, like, fully, like, humiliating for them, but... Otherwise, like, for example, Elon Fives arc, that totally fizzled out in kind of a weird, funny way. He just kind of, like, didn't really do anything after Noria died. And OG Elon got a shocking victory. Like, I really don't think he deserved to have a happy ending for how shitty and evil a character he was in the long run of the show. Like, it's kind of funny that he and Five had a lot in common at the end, with them just both wanting to save themselves. But yeah, Ghoul's arc, that was a natural ending. He took over his dad's company and became his dad, but... I'm kind of bummed he didn't end up together with Felsi just because they didn't, like, have enough time to ship them together. So he just full-on became a working man dedicated to his job. Lada, though. Lada got a shocking victory. I did not expect full victory for Lada. Lada, Lada had such a nuts arc because he went nuts. I gotta blame this as another, like, problem with the screen time of the show. But, like, I'm shocked he got no punishment at all for nearly killing his brother, stealing a mobile suit. And exposing himself to deadly gun permit instead he just gets back together with petra and they live a happy life i feel like if there had been a little bit more time to play this out like 
there definitely needed to be more of a down settling period this episode almost barely had one when he confronts Aletta but he should have gone back to Petra like Petra should like given him like some dramatic speech about how wrong he was instead we just get this awesome Felsey moment which was like the bare minimum a great Felsey moment probably the greatest Felsey moment but I'm not sure how it like affects everyone else's story like I don't get why Lada had a moment with Selena like that was random like Sure, he had been a dick to Selena, but he had way more serious drama going off Ghoul and Mirin, and those are the people that Lada should have addressed. Like, the biggest surprise for me that was that, like, Shadik both won and lost in the end, with Mirin peacefully giving him exactly what he wanted in the end, except he's still on trial for terrorism, and it was terrorism he committed in trying to commit all the terrorism by himself. Shadik honestly had the weakest and weirdest arc in the story, like, the dude destroyed his life for nothing. If he had just supported Mirin from the beginning, he would have gotten everything he wanted. But in the end, he still got everything he wanted, except he's going to die in prison. So, like, really, he just kind of shot himself in the foot and didn't really do anything meaningful towards his own goals. Since the show was on speed mode, like, the entire second season, all the Earth drama that Shadig probably would have been, like, running was just, like, completely cut out. And this had an incredible, like, damaging effect on just ruining Shadik's character. Like, I feel like they were really setting up Shadik to be, like, a clone of Zex. But since all his plots got cut so short, they just had to wrap his arc up without him, like, doing anything significant. I'm also super bummed that Chuchu and Roji just ended up as a couple of dock workers. Why are they working together? Why are they suddenly a couple? Like, I really expected there to be more to Roji, and Chuchu deserved better. It's kind of funny that Ghoul, OG Elon, and Cecilia are running the school now, seemingly putting them all full circle from where we were at episode 1, except episode 1 was Elon 4, not the OG, but still. I'm also kind of surprised Nika turned herself into prison and she only got 3 years for a role in helping the terrorist plot. Like, also, Sadiq's harem, seemingly they were out of jail already, so they seemingly got less time in jail for directly helping him than Nika did for sort of helping him. Especially since Mirin had already been setting them up with political jobs on Earth. I guess Nika could have used a better defense attorney, but yeah, I really am shocked that Nika was in prison for three years. I mean, I guess it made sense for her character, but did she really do all that much wrong in the end? Remind me of how many crimes Nika actually committed. Like, I really don't think she did anything super serious except for, like, not, like, turning in Shadik as soon as she knew he was a terrorist. Like, finally reflecting on Salah and Mirin in the end, Obviously they got married, but we don't see the wedding. They just skip that over it. Now, they alluded to their marriage on like three different occasions of like the Aerie being referred to as a sister-in-law and Miriam blatantly waving her wedding ring to the camera. I'm not sure if I'm okay with Aerie spending the rest of her eternity as a keychain. Oh wait, eternity? Oh my god, Aerie is an immortal keychain now. Aerie is going to watch all her family like grow old and die and she's still going to be a keychain but yeah Aerie's a keychain now that's ridiculous like also it was completely convoluted that all the Gundam magically dissolved at the end like what the fuck is permit really if it decides it can suddenly eat metal like how is Mirin ever going to market gun metal technology if it eats the metal like I think it's kind of crap since all the Gundams dissolved especially the ferret Ferret hadn't even been used in any decent capacity this season since Elon 4 died. Like, I guess it's great that Ares finally reunited with her family and all, but now she's a keychain. An immovable, immortal, plastic keychain. Like, I don't know how she's happy with that. That sounds like hell. Like, I think I would have been, like, more satisfied if she died, but, like, maybe if Saleta can send Ares into a keychain, they can eventually figure her out and send her into another Gundam. Ugh, maybe that's the sequel. But, for the love of God, I don't think Aerie deserved to be a keychain. Like, I think she would have been better off just dying and going to the afterlife with, like, her dad and the other permit ghosts. I guess having her available to talk to is kind of keeping Prospera sane, though, but I definitely think Prospera has to feel, like, some kind of guilt about, like, how she ended up. Anyway, back to Salad and Mirin. Mirin got pretty much the ending I was expecting to see. She got the cliche Gundam princess ending, you know, I was a girl, then I was a princess, now I'm a legitimate politician and everyone respects me. 
I've seen this arc play out a dozens of times. It's Rolina's arc, it's Cadelia's arc. Like, th this arc is cliche, so I'm, like, not super, like, surprised about it. I will say, though, that overall in the entire show, Mirin still had the most main character energy, like, throughout the show start to finish, especially since Saleta kept getting benched for most of season two while the politics and the drama played out. Like, it's funny because I've seen a lot of robot anime, and a lot of robot anime, when push comes to shove, they'll cut out the robot battles and focus on the plot. But Witcher Mercury took that aspect another dimension further by not only cutting out robot battles, but also cutting out the main character's plot progression due to the show running short. Like, there was so much of Saleta that we just didn't get to see. Uh, so calling it now, what the fuck was the brainwashed Saleta twist at the end of season one? Because now that seems like a plot hole. Maybe we could have all misread this situation, but there was a clear implication there that Prosper could brainwash Saleta on a whim if it was necessary to complete her evil plan. Like, this episode was officially the first time Saleta finally stood up to Prosper, and I guess Prosper just let it happen with very little pushback because Mirin had been, like, reeling into her, like, in the past episode. But, eh, I don't know. Overall, I guess this was an alright ending. It was a typical ending. It was an ending that I would have expected. But damn it, this second season really needed more episodes to just breathe better and dedicate more time to, like, the various things going on. Especially on this last episode and on this epilogue. The epilogue was only, like, three minutes. Like, there were so many things in season two they just skipped over that I would have wanted to see. Like, the Earthfront War or, like better development on like the whole Lana situation or for the love of god just more screen time for Saleta. like there were so many episodes in season two where Saleta just wasn't in the episode like every time Saleta seemed like she was about to have a major significant character moment the show just like flash forward past it literally all the best Saleta moments in season two are things we just have to imagine she did and that's weird for me but yeah, anyway, so that's season two. It um, It's over. I guess that's the show entirely over. Um, yeah, this was a pretty decent Gundam. Not the best Gundam, but yeah, yeah I, I was happy for the most part. Season two was way too rushed, and that left me feeling pretty unsatisfied in a new number of ways. But eh, oh well. All right, um, I'm going to come back next week and do an overall review of the whole series because I feel like I need to take a step back and, like, review everything. Plus, that will give me a chance to gather one more week of memes for, like, the memes that happened this week. All right, I'll see you guys next week, guys. Um, let me know what you thought about the ending. And um, were you satisfied with how everyone's stories turned out? Are there any endings that you think, like, came out weird or weren't deserved? Like, I don't think Lada deserved a happy ending. I don't think Aerie deserved to be a keychain, but everything else was, like, okay-ish. Oh, and Choo Choo definitely could have done better than Dock Worker, but still. Yeah, let me know what you guys think. All right, leave a comment. Later. Subscribe. Good night.